100 million people died from smoking in the 20th century. More than World War II. More than the Spanish flu. Everybody knows that smoking is bad for you. Everyone knows that it gives you lung cancer. And I know you're sick of hearing about it. But actually, the dangers are still understated. People around the world continue to rationalize their cigarette use. I'll quit when I'm older. It's not that bad. My 86-year-old grandmother smokes, and she's okay. Everybody has to die sometime. I just want to enjoy life now. The problem is, it's hard to keep rationalizing your smoking habit when you're hooked up to a ventilator 24-7 to keep you alive. Lung cancer, throat cancer, all kinds of cancers, bronchitis, heart attacks, strokes, macular degeneration. If you're somebody who prefers to live in the moment and doesn't worry about future consequences, then consider the following. Death from smoking is painful and prolonged. Most patients have their freedom gradually more and more restricted until they're not allowed to leave their own home because they need a machine to breathe. Other smokers literally suffocate to death, often in their homes, completely alone. This is real. This isn't something that happens to characters in movies or people in documentaries. This is something that happens to real people, people just like you. And there's absolutely no reason that it won't happen to you or your loved ones if the smoking continues. The problem is, cigarettes are normal. It's normal to take a smoke break at work. It's normal to meet people in the smoking area, at the club. It's normal smoke when you drink, when you eat, when you have sex or when you wake up in the morning. Nothing beats a cigarette after sex, right? When you see other people doing an action, your subconscious brain believes that the activity must be safe. And so you don't feel fear as you inhale thousands of chemicals into your lungs. You know intellectually that smoking is bad, but you don't feel like it's dangerous. Your subconscious brain doesn't understand that a huge portion of the population you're surrounded by is hooked onto a highly addictive substance that's slowly killing them. Not only is smoking normal, but you might even think it's cool. Do you feel cool as you breathe in that sweet, sweet smoke and look off wistfully into the distance, contemplating life? Or as you flick open that lighter and hold it up to your mouth, do you feel cool as light up another one in the smoking area of the club with all the other cool kids? Bottle of beer in one hand, cigarette in the other. Do you feel like a rebel? Do you feel unique? Do you feel artistic? I'd like to offer an alternative viewpoint. Smokers are conformists. Smokers are sheep. Smokers are losers. Now if you're a smoker, don't be offended. It's not your fault that you've been duped by a media and a culture into thinking that smoking is cool ever since you were a child. Advertising, movies, TV and the people around you have convinced you that slowly killing yourself is cool. You bought in. And it's okay. You just need to understand exactly how you've been brainwashed so you can better fight the addiction you're dealing with. Now not everyone thinks smoking is cool. And if you think smoking is massively uncool, then this video isn't for you. But if you're a smoker and a part of you still believes that smoking is rebellious, masculine, tough or just plain cool, then this video is for you. Why you think smoking is cool? Why is smoking constantly portrayed in a stylish manner? Is this really how people look in real life while they smoke? In the 1920s, Smoking was seen as an inappropriate habit for women and was looked down upon as distasteful. Some women began to smoke as they took over a number of male jobs in World War I. George Washington Hill, the president of the American Tobacco Company, realized the potential market that could be found in women. It will be like a gold mine opening in our front yard, he said in 1928. But he had a problem. Smoking for women was completely taboo. So he enlisted the help of Edward Bernie's. Bernie's had the perfect plan to break this taboo. Every year New York held an Easter Day parade in which thousands of people attended. He persuaded a group of feminists to hide cigarettes under their clothes during the parade. He instructed them to light up their cigarettes on his signal. Bernie's then informed the press that he'd heard a group of suffragettes were preparing to protest by lighting up cigarettes. The press couldn't miss such an outrage. So photographers lined up to capture the moment. Edith Lee smokes a cigarette on the torches for Freedom March, New York, 1929. 
To the public she seems like an independent feminist who decided to smoke out of rebellion. In truth, she's doing what Edward Bernie's asked her to do to promote cigarette smoking for women. All of the major newspapers covered the event, and newspapers reported the young women and their torches of freedom. From that point forward, the sale of cigarettes to women began to skyrocket. With a single symbolic act, Bernie's had broken the taboo towards women smoking cigarettes and made them socially acceptable. He had also managed to link cigarettes with rebelliousness and female empowerment, an idea that is still strong in the minds of modern people. Women up and down the country began furiously lighting up cigarettes as a symbol of empowerment and freedom, never realizing that they were manipulated by Edward Bernie's and the tobacco industry. The message is clear, be a tough motherfucker. Smoke. But actually, what does smoking have to do with being tough? Do you think smoking makes you tough? In the 1950s people were starting to get concerned about the health consequences of cigarettes. So cigarette brands began releasing the filtered cigarette. Adding a filter, they said, made the cigarette safe to smoke. Most cigarette companies based their advertising around the technology of the filter. They wanted to ease fears about smoking. Marlboro took a different approach, making adverts completely devoid of health concerns or health claims. Instead, they opted for the gun-slinging badass of the Wild West, Marlboro Man. In 1955, when when the Marlboro Man campaign started, sales were at $5 billion. In 1957, sales had reached $20 billion. It was an enormous success. Marlboro easily overcame growing health concerns, and their sales continued to increase. After all, the Marlboro Man wouldn't be scared of a little health issue, and he's a real man. The public had been successfully manipulated by mass marketing. An association had been created in the minds of people everywhere. Smoking equals masculinity. Men everywhere started looking wistfully off into the distance, putting a cigarette between their lips and feeling like a real man as they slowly killed themselves. Teenage boys everywhere started smoking, trying to prove to their friends that they were a tough guy just like the Marlboro Man starting an addiction that would later rob them of their life. The idea created by the Marlboro Man continues to persist, even today. And men continue to smoke cigarettes at least partly, because of the masculine feeling it gives them. It's ironic that many men believe that smoking makes them more masculine, when smoking has been proven to lower your sperm count and cause erectile dysfunction. And all of this glamorization was created to distract the public from one simple fact. Cigarettes are deadly. We have one essential job, stop public panic. There is only one problem, confidence, and how to establish it. And most important, how to free millions of Americans from the guilty fear that's going to arise in their biological depths every time they light a cigarette. Pierre Firm Hill and Knowlton in 1953. So Edward Bernie's managed to link cigarettes with rebelliousness and independence in women. Marlboro managed to link cigarettes with toughness and masculinity. The messages from these to marketing campaigns pulsated through the decades and still hold influence over many of us today. But it wasn't only advertisers that manipulated how we feel about cigarettes. Cigarettes in movies. It's the movies that have really been running things in America ever since they were invented. They show you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, how to feel about it, and how to look how you feel about it. Andy Warhol, you've been primed to believe that smoking is cool ever since you were a child, and you barely even noticed. In mainstream cinema, the cigarette is a sign of a badass. Just how many times have you seen the rebellious character light up a cigarette on screen? How many times have you seen him, her puff on that cigarette with an I don't give a fuck expression on their face? You've seen this thousands of times since you were a child. A long time ago your brain made a connection between cigarettes and rebelliousness, a connection that still exists in your subconscious mind today. If I was to ask you what exactly is so rebelliousness about smoking cigarettes, would you be able to give me a logical answer? What exactly is rebellious about spending your hard-earned money on hundreds of packs of cigarettes? What's rebellious about picking up a common addiction and giving your money over to cigarette manufacturers? The truth is there's no rational reason for you to feel like smoking is rebellious. The reason you might feel that way is because of the media you've been watching since the day you were born. By the way, 
Actors in movies don't smoke real cigarettes. They usually smoke healthy herbal cigarettes. The Center for Disease Prevention and Control has solid evidence that smoking shown in movies causes young people to start smoking. Movies are a great way to initiate young people into smoking. The tobacco industry calls them replacement smokers to replace the smokers who died from using their product. Why is there so much smoking in movies? Two reasons. One, the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry are the original champions of product placement. In released documents, the following deals between the tobacco industry and the movie industry have been proven. $350,000 to have Lark cigarettes appear in the James Bond movie License to Kill. $42,000 to place Marlboro cigarettes in Superman 2. $30,000 to place Eve cigarettes in Supergirl. $5,000 to have Lucky Strike appear in Beverly Hills Cop. $500,000 for Sylvester Stallone to use Brown and Williamson products in five feature films. And these are just the few deals we know about. Other deals were undoubtedly made behind closed doors, but we have no access to those records. Even so, it seems highly likely that the tobacco industry had something to do with the prevalence of cigarettes in movies. As you can see, the scenes in both the advertisements and movies of the time are eerily similar, probably because the tobacco industry held influence over the script of many of these movies. Film is better than any commercial that has been run on television or any magazine. Because the audience is totally unaware of any sponsor involvement, CEO of Production Incorporated Robert Richards talking to President of R.J. or William Smith, there are far more smokers in movies than in real life, and the health consequences of smoking are rarely ever seen in movies. An endless list of studies has shown that cigarette smoking in movies leads to smoking initiation in teenagers. We don't know exactly how many deals were made between the tobacco industry and Hollywood. But we do know that the tobacco industry was well aware of the power of movies to change public opinion. It's reasonable to assume that the tobacco industry has been heavily involved in Hollywood throughout the decades. To lazy script writing, cigarette manufacturers had created an association between cigarettes and masculinity, rebelliousness and independence. This association was then reinforced by the movie industry, often without any help from the tobacco industry. The cigarette became a plot device. Want to make a character seem more rebellious? Put a cigarette in their hand, and the audience will immediately understand what kind of character they're dealing with. Of course, there is nothing inherently rebellious about holding a cigarette. Cigarettes are nothing more than nicotine, tobacco and an assortment of chemicals wrapped in paper. But the public and the writers already had a particular emotional connection towards cigarettes instilled in them by the tobacco industry. So cigarettes got endless amounts of free advertising through the movie industry. The tobacco industry in 2021. Cigarettes are not a problem of the past. They're a problem of the present. Yes, the number of smokers in developed countries is dropping. Government-led anti-smoking campaigns have had an impact on the psyche of the public. Many now see cigarettes as the deadly, addictive and life-ruining devices they really are. There are health warnings on every cigarette packet and cigarette advertising is completely banned. But guess what? The tobacco industry isn't declining. It's booming. Confused. The following image is from modern-day Indonesia. No, this isn't the US 50 years ago. It's Indonesia in 2020. Indonesia is now the second largest cigarette market in the world. 36% of the population are reported smokers. 63% of men and only 5% of women. Advertising for cigarettes can be found on billboards, on TV, in magazines, online and almost anywhere else you can think of. Almost all major events in Indonesia are sponsored by cigarette brands, especially events of a more Western nature. Why is cigarette advertising allowed in Indonesia? Because cigarette brands lobby the Indonesian government to stop any regulation being passed. Indonesia is a developing country that's trying to lift itself out of poverty. Cigarette brands are taking advantage of this and using the vulnerability of the government to make extreme profits. The exact same marketing strategies that were used on developed countries decades ago are being used in developing countries. From Indonesia to Africa, because movies and advertising made a link between smoking 
and masculinity in the minds of the Indonesian public. 63% of Indonesian men are smokers. Cigarettes are ridiculously cheap in Indonesia, at around $1.20 a pack and they're far stronger than the cigarettes we have in the West. It's no surprise then, that lung cancer is increasing. Over 200,000 people die from cigarettes in Indonesia every year. And it's not just Indonesia. The tobacco industry is taking advantage of countries all over the developing world. They have moved the cigarette epidemic from developed countries to developing countries. The biggest problem the tobacco industry has is that its customers keep dying. Two-thirds of long-term smokers will die from smoking-related illnesses. That's why it needs to focus on what they call replacement smokers by constantly advertising to young people in developing countries. The tobacco industry is doing fantastic. And they're still making billions of dollars through the legal sale of a highly addictive drug, nicotine. It may be useful, therefore, to look at the tobacco industry as if for a large part of its business is the administration of nicotine bat scientists. In 1967, here's the truth. A cigarette is simply the delivery device for a highly addictive drug called nicotine. It's not masculine. It's not rebellious. It's not artistic. It's not a sign of independence. These are all lies sold to you by the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry doesn't see smokers as human beings. It sees them as walking dollar signs. They have no morality and they're perfectly happy if their product kills hundreds of millions of people. As long as it keeps producing insane profits. Every single time you feel cool as you light up a cigarette, the tobacco industry is laughing at you. And every time a teenage boy lights up a cigarette because he thinks it's manly. The tobacco industry rubs its hands together 